Well, good morning and welcome to the North Texas Church of Free Thought. It's June 9th of 2024. Atheists, non-theists, unbelievers, humanists, rationalists, those are a few of the terms that could describe us. Labels have their advantages and their drawbacks, of course. Each of these and others have their particular costs and benefits. We have at times, for example, talked about how the term atheist, however applicable it may be and however proud some are of it, plays into the agenda of godmongers. How? by conducting the struggle of conflicting views of religion on their turf and with their rules. We say, and this is part of the whole basis of the Church of Free Thought, the rules have already changed. Religion is not about gods, and it's certainly not about how we should live our private lives or make our personal choices that do not harm others. We have science to help us discover how the world out there beyond our imaginations really works, so we don't need theological nonsense to tell us how the universe, our planet, and ourselves came about. Likewise, we have secular laws and reasonable institutions for making and practically enforcing those laws that have to do with protecting the safety and rights of everyone. And as for our personal ideals and morality, that too is not up to the self-appointed mouthpieces for the imaginary supernatural forces. So we prefer the terms freethinker and freethought. Those terms have been around since the late 17th century. Originally, it embraced and seems to have primarily referred to deism, the idea that a supreme deity, though not necessarily a person or personal god, created the universe, but then pretty much left it to run on its own. Now, this uh, may have been in a pre-programmed manner, since at that time the best science was predicated on determinism. This was not an irrational view at the time, inasmuch as even the best scientific understanding could not see its way past the puzzle of the distinction between living and non-living things. People then didn't worry so much about, oh, where did everything come from? They worried about, how can this rock be just sitting there, but how come this squirrel runs over it, and what's, what's so different about them? Well, it would not be until 1828 that the German chemist Friedrich Wöhler synthesized an organic substance, urea, from inorganic precursors. Here you see how he did it on the left and how it happens in uh, living things on the right. And because nobody had been able to do on the left there previously, and Verler was quite amazed with himself when he was able to do it, this had previously been thought to be impossible uh, because the vital force that characterized living things was supposed to be in some way supernatural. But Verler's feet opened the way for the acceptance of the idea advanced by the French physician Julien Offray de Lemaitre, that living things are essentially machines. That is to say, living things, including people, are systems of material parts that utilize an energy source to autonomously apply forces, control movements, and carry out other mechanical actions. Then, as we know, in 1838, Charles Darwin had the insight of how living things could evolve over geologic time through a process of natural selection operating on genetically determined individual variations among living things. He finally published the idea in his famous Origin of Species in 1859. And of course, that was after uh, Alfred uh, Wallace uh, wrote somebody, might have been him, asking about what did he think of this idea? And of course, he'd been working on it already for years. Well, upon reading uh, this book on the left there, The Origin of Species, Darwin's friend and colleague, Thomas Henry Huxley, known as Darwin's Bulldog because of his defense of uh, the idea of evolution, he had this reaction, how extremely stupid of me not to have thought of that. That's a common feeling among thoughtful people. It's one of, Eureka, I get it, but why did I not think of that myself? Fast forward to the present. Free thought is a religion since it encompasses, as the American philosopher and psychologist William James described religion, one's total reaction upon life. It also well satisfies the U.S. Supreme Court's functional definition of religion. Remember, the First Amendment does not define the term religion, even though it prohibits the government from legislating about it. It defines religion as a sincere and meaningful belief which occupies in the life of its possessor a place parallel to that filled by the God of traditional religions. So let's get on with the subject of how to be a free thinker. To become a Muslim, one must say this Shahada, that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Oops, I just became a Muslim. Wow. 
Most sources add, though, that the words must be said, quote, with conviction and understanding of its meaning. Now, that's quite a qualification, isn't it, for what does it mean? What can it mean? And as much as God and Allah are incoherent notions, how can such meaninglessness be meaningful? Uh, we could actually rephrase this as saying, there is no God but the one that Muhammad claimed to be a prophet of, and Muhammad is the prophet of this God. Wow, you know, how profound profoundly devoid of substance and meaning. Is it a surprise that the human mind becomes warped by this sort of sustained pretense that the absurd is profound? Well, Christianity is not much better. Here's what it says in uh, Acts in the New Testament. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. To become a Christian is not much more complicated, uh, as you can see, but it's uh, no less mind-numbing. This is what the New Testament says, but it's the same idea of willful belief in the incoherent and incomprehensible. Most sources expand it a bit by saying that uh, to be a Christian, one, one must also believe that one is a sinner, that one has done wrong, although wrong for these believers means no more than offending God. That, as we know, doesn't have to be hurting other people or stealing their stuff. In fact, the Bible deity at times approve of, approves of people killing other people and stealing their stuff. Sin could be a lot of things, depending on the variety of Christianity. Apologists for this religion would have it that simply not being perfect is the same as being sinful. Think about that. Being subject to making mistakes, on their view, is a sin. Being capable of improvement, of learning new things, of growing, of doing better, these are all elements of being a sinner in the Christian way of looking at things. Then, in addition, one must believe that Jesus was crucified to save one from one's sins. Well, who required that? Well, some bloodthirsty you know, father. And no one can be a truly good person without Jesus, they say. So you have to have that faith belief for the crucifixion to work for you. How odd that you have to believe in it for it to be true. Oh, and then there's baptism. You ever wonder what the difference is between Baptists and Anabaptists? They kind of sound like opposites. Well... We're not going to get into that today. That's enough boggling of the mind of the Christian sort for now. Becoming a Jew is more complicated than reciting a creed or believing in a list of things. It involves study with a rabbi. And if you're male, even in Reformed Judaism, circumcision is required. If you are male and you're already circumcised, you must still undergo the circumcision ceremony and some blood must be drawn from the same body part. Of course, you can also be born Jewish if your mother was Jewish. Uh, interestingly, in that situation, if the adults don't get you circumcised, but your mother is Jewish, you're still a Jew. Although it's not a creedal statement, Judaism does have these three blessings, uh, which you see there. First one, blessed are you, Hashem, or G slash G dash D, because they, they don't want us. To, Hashem means uh, the name because they think that uh, if you actually name God and they have his name, that that's taking it in vain unless you're praising him. And king of the world who did not make me a Gentile. Thanks for not making me a Gentile. And then the next line, next one is uh, similar. Uh, Blessed are you, Hashem, etc., who did not make me a slave. Uh, women would say a maid servant. And lastly, blessed are you, Hashem, and king of the world who did not make me a woman. Women say, who made me according to his will. How nice. As I said, Hashem means literally the name, since devout Jews consider it blasphemy to use the actual name of their deity, Yahweh or Jehovah, which is uh, why they say G-D instead of just God. It has something to do with that commandment that says not to take his name in vain, which happens if a Jew says the name without a lengthy and effusive outpouring of praise after saying it, much as Muslims always say, peace be upon him after saying the name of Muhammad and sometimes other prophets such as Jesus. Now, except for Islam, most religious traditions also have initiation rituals. Jews have circumcision, and they have a sort of baptism, a mikvah, or mikvah is what they dunk you in, I guess, or that's the, uh, the source of natural water. Christians have, of course, baptism, and if you're Catholic, a bunch of other sacraments to keep you roped into the cult, all of which have supernatural significance. Uh, by the way, that top left there is the circumcision. And uh, what's that guy doing on the baby's crotch? Well, part of the uh, ceremony with the uh, Orthodox is that the uh, moil, the guy doing the circumcision, has to suck some blood from the wound that he makes. Ooh, great. Little babies have caught herpes that way. Uh, so even Unitarians have some life passage ceremonies, but they seem more a response to popular demand than important religious rituals. There's certainly not uh, any kind of supernatural things going on. 
Buddhism, some forms of it anyway, require the triple gem or three jewels ceremony and often other affirmations of the teachings of the Buddha. And there's this weird ritual among Sikhs involving initiates drinking water that has been poured over the toes of their gurus. I should have looked for a photo of that. Apparently, that's not required to be a Sikh. It is said that many people come into Sikhism through practicing yoga, so that's a ritual of sorts. There's somebody on the middle bottom who's uh, turning themselves into a pretzel. Uh, but to be a Sikh, you also have to abstain from smoking, drinking, eating meat, and whatever the Sikhs consider to be illicit sex. So how does one become a free thinker? Importantly, making a creedal statement, much less willfully choosing to believe in things or agreeing that arbitrary things are wrong, plays no part in it. In fact, free thought is the exact opposite of these things. Blaise Pascal, famous for his wager, took it for granted that anyone can just decide to believe in things. But can people just decide to believe in things the way they can decide to order items off a restaurant menu? It is, at the very least, an open question. It's a question that we'll have to leave for another day, but for now, just consider how often it is openly asked. Have you ever seen or heard it discussed? It's just assumed. We see debates on whether God exists or whether there's free will or not, but it seems that this idea of intentional, voluntary belief is seldom explicitly addressed. The only clue that there is a serious problem with the idea, and it is certainly a very large clue, is that in the context of belief in supernatural religious doctrines, but in no other circumstances, interestingly, it gets papered over with this notion of faith. As said, we'll get into this more another time, but before we move on, it's important to realize just how central this question begging is to Christianity, which almost certainly accounts for the fact that faith has come to be what many people suppose religion is. Here's what Thomas Aquinas uh, said, a uh, 13th century uh, Catholic, the well, Christian theologian, perhaps uh, Christianity is in fact uh, greatest theologian, he said, the gravity of sin is determined by the interval which it places between man and God. And since the repudiation of faith divides man from God as far as possible, it therefore follows that this, the denial of the idea of intentional voluntary belief, is the greatest of all sins. How about that? So to be a free thinker is to embrace that sin of faithlessness. It is to refuse to believe anything on faith. In that sense, from Aquinas' point of view, and if religion is faith, it could be supposed that free thought is an anti-religion or even a not-religion. This would square with the idea that even many atheists have that they have no religion. It's not a sensible way to look at it for many reasons that we've talked about for a long time. One reason is that it privileges supernaturalism, irrationalism, and pseudoscience. That is clearly unacceptable. Among other things, it would legitimize criminals defending their actions by saying that God commanded them to hurt or kill other people. That is not far-fetched. It used to happen all the time. And we still have laws on the books uh, with religious exemptions for other obligations, getting vaccines and taking care of your kids or going, uh, you know, having a blood transfusion if it's going to save your child's life and so on. And we still have, of course, business owners refusing to serve LGBT folks because, well, God would object to, to their doing so. Another important reason not to categorize some opinions on religion as not religion is that it would strip those who hold those opinions of their religious liberty. Again, not acceptable. And consider this. For those who consider the repudiation of faith as the greatest of all sins, embracing that sin can be justifiably seen as being in league with the forces of evil and even a sort of devil worship or Satanism. Identifying as Satanists may be a cute way of riling up the fundamentalist crazies, true, but it's not how we freethinkers see ourselves. Free thought is no more an anti-religion or a not-religion than is the early form of Gnostic Christianity preached by Martian of Sinope. Uh, that's a little town on the uh, Black Sea coast in, in what is now Turkey. Um, but just because in some respects that uh, which uh, Marcion, this guy, was preached was the opposite of proto-Orthodox proto Christianity, which regarded it as a heresy, there's no reason to say that it's not a religion. Marcion held that the deity of the Hebrew scriptures was an evil being, different than and opposed to the benevolent God that sent Jesus to save the world. Well, that's not at all an unreasonable view. In fact, it's a rather appealing approach to read the often outrageous and horrifying Old Testament in the context of the mostly tolerant and loving New Testament teachings of Jesus. 
Just imagine if Marcion's views had won out, how different would Christianity be today? But although Marcion did not prevail, he was still an important early Christian theologian. It was Marcion that compiled the first New Testament. Where do you think the New Testament came from? Well, he started it. His New Testament consisted of a shorter version of the Gospel of Luke and Acts and 10 of the Pauline epistles. Oh yes, Marcion considered, considered Paul to be on his side of the argument, and Paul can certainly be read that way. So if being a freethinker means rejecting faith, how do freethinkers justify their beliefs, and what do they believe? Well, how are beliefs acquired if we exclude beliefs that require faith? You know, beliefs that fairy tales are facts because those fairy tales happen to be found in holy books, or because lots of other people believe in the fairy tales, or because it's claimed by authorities and other important people that it's virtuous to believe those fairy tales are facts. Well, there seem to be three broad categories that are mostly uncontroversial grounds for belief, belief that does not require faith. First of all, there's firsthand experience. Free thinkers accept their firsthand experience as such, as most people do, well, as long as they're not taking psychedelic drugs or something. So, And then secondly are the experiences of other people, secondhand experiences, either recounted directly to others or recorded in books or by other means. Free thinkers accept that if someone says they saw or did something, that the someone is asserting it and has some reason for asserting it, which includes the reason, possibly, that they really did see or do something. And lastly, there are conclusions reached by a process of reasoning about first- or second-hand experience that includes relating such experience to prior knowledge and understanding. These are beliefs that follow or appear to follow from a process of inference or deduction. Now, we could think of Sherlock Holmes deducing the identity of a criminal from the fact that a guard dog did not bark. That fact informed him who the, uh, who the perpetrator was. Now, this last category probably accounts for, I would say, easily the bulk of scientific knowledge and even the majority of the beliefs of most educated and intelligent people in civilized society. This is just because firsthand experience is limited to, well, firsthand experiences. And although most people interact with lots of other people, there's only so much of the personal experiences of friends and family and other acquaintances that is convenient to catalog, although some may be in command of a lot of such information. Even most of the goddesses who are not clergy or theologians have quite a limited collection of their faith beliefs and their preferred fairy tales. And they go to great lengths to ignore or explain away obvious inconsistencies and contradictions. They don't apply reason to those things. Hence the need for the amazing miracles and representing absurdities to be awesome divine mysteries. Notice, too, that when beliefs go beyond immediate firsthand experience, and especially when they involve placing such experience or what others uh, say of their experiences in context and applying reason, more is demanded of the person considering such things. You can't just sit back and see it, hear it, etc. Someone with a greater fund of knowledge and experience has more to work with than someone who has less. That's why uh, any of us, if we're very uh, knowledgeable about something, we'll hear an ad on TV or read something in the newspaper and say, oh, what a bunch of garbage that is. But the things we know less about, we're more likely to be taken in. And in addition, like most anything else, practice makes perfect. People with a reputation for being highly intelligent tend to have had a lot of practice at making sense of various things. And longtime residents of a city or those who work in large buildings, they tend to know their way around those places because you get familiar with them, you get, get to know them. This third category of human understanding also depends very much on a variety of assumptions that go into the reasoning by which it is reached. And that creates some potential for its being wrong. That is, it's not likely that you'll change your belief about what you had for breakfast or what your neighbor told you about the vacation they just returned from. But the kinds of understanding that depend on the analysis of large amounts of data and statistical manipulation of that data, like when people say, well, science says this, that may involve many assumptions that may or may not be applicable or justified. And if you don't know what they are, you're not in a very good position to judge. Probably they're good if it withstands a lot of scientific peer review and scrutiny and is still believed in years later, then you know it gets more reliable. But the latest measurements from a space probe orbiting Jupiter might very well undermine previous assumptions about the conditions there and, in turn, what had been known or believed about the solar system's largest planet. Most of us are also aware of situations where new forensic testing show that someone that eyewitnesses saw commit a crime, someone tried and convicted by a jury of their peers, someone who may even have been condemned to death could not possibly, in fact, have done the deed. 
We could go on and on with many such examples. Once upon a time, it was believed the earth was at the center of the universe. It, is, it was at the center of the universe as far as everyone was concerned. Once upon a time, there was phlogiston. Oh, that's worth reading up on. I think we should teach the controversy of phlogiston. And once upon a time, as said earlier, there was this vital force, a kind of special energy that was the only possible explanation for the chasm of difference between living and non-living things. Less than a century ago, we lived in a deterministic universe, and so on. You may have noticed that we began, we began by talking about belief, but then additional terms, knowledge and understanding, were introduced. To some degree, these terms, beliefs, knowledge, and understanding, are synonymous. They have the same or a very similar denotation, but they carry different, very different connotations. Belief usually expresses a lower level of confidence or certainty than knowledge. Understanding tends to imply an appreciation of what is believed or known in a larger context. And what about truth? Where does that fit in? These terms can also be combined or used together. One may say, for example, that I believe I know that, or I believe I have a good understanding of it. And we may ask many interesting questions in this way. Do we know what we believe? Is that knowledge? Just because we believe it, do we understand what we know? And what do we even mean by truth if we cannot be sure we know it? Clearly, few, if any, people who say they believe in things on faith have a good understanding of what they say they believe. And this, uh, as we know, affords unbelievers plenty of amusement along the lines of, well, can God make a square circle? Can he make a rock too heavy for him to lift? And, of course, there's this wonderful, well-known black cat analogy. Philosophy is being in a dark room and looking for a black cat. Metaphysics is being in a dark room and looking for a black cat that's not there. And theology is like being in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there and shouting, I found it. So there is a fundamental uncertainty, and not just the one that bears Heisenberg's name, at the bottom of human understanding. We are fallible. We make mistakes. We can be misled. We are not in command of all the facts, and never will be. Nor have we thought of all the possible ways to put the facts together or resolve the inevitable mismatches and contradictions. There are many of those in science, and even more in our everyday lives. All we can do is our best. Life is a puzzle to which we will never have all the pieces, but we must always try to put what pieces we do have together in ways that are consistent with the principles of reason. And what is reason? Again, that's a subject for another day, but we can think of reason as a sort of distillation and abstraction or maximum generalization of all of our other experience. Our fallibility is not a bad thing, so long as we recognize it and approach life and its many questions with the sort of humility that is needed. What this means is that we must nurture doubt, not faith, so that we are open to revising, to improving, to making better sense of things today than we did yesterday. It is as important, perhaps more important, not to believe what is wrong than to believe what is right. So in summary, the way to be a free thinker is, first of all, to reject the perverse and immoral idea of faith and instead heed the dictum of British mathematician and philosopher William Kingdon Clifford, who wrote this wonderful, notable 1877 essay, The Ethics of Belief. If you've never read it, you need to go online. You can find it for free. Read that. He made the case for this simple principle. And we see here an explicit link between belief and morality. Too often, this connection is ignored. To be a free thinker is to hold with uh, Thomas Henry Huxley. We mentioned him already. Remember Darwin's bulldog that the most sacred act of a man's life is to say and to feel, I believe such and such to be true. Most sac sacred act of a woman's life, too, I would say. This attitude takes belief seriously and holds it in the highest regard, whereas the supernaturalist religions have debauched belief with their faith doctrines, with the predictable result that belief is often not given the respect it deserves. But freethinkers, because they do care whether beliefs are true, whether they are consistent with facts and reason, whether they are justified by sufficient evidence, set that bar for sufficient evidence high, for they know that believing what is wrong can lead to all sorts of terrible consequences. Just look at what belief in witchcraft led to. Just look at what belief in the inferiority of more darkly complected people, of belief in races, which we know do not exist in humans. Look what that led to, the consequences of which we are still suffering from today. And belief in what is wrong is also, perhaps more than anything else, a hindrance to understanding. If you think you already have the truth, after all, why bother to seek the truth? 
Whereas to be a free thinker is to always have in mind at some level that what even everyone thinks is the truth may be mistaken, or at least may not quite be the whole truth. In practice, therefore, free thinkers should have few beliefs. And I think that's a good principle generally. Think of all the people who are trying to get you to adopt beliefs to uh, benefit them. So you got to be very careful now more than ever. Anytime you see an ad in conjunction with something you're some kind of fact you're reading, you have to realize the facts can be selective um, and people are sloppy with them. And other people don't respect the truth. They don't respect belief the way free thinkers do. On the other hand, free thinkers, more than others perhaps, many of what might be called uh, that we have many proto-beliefs or what might be's. It's not necessary to believe, for example, that the universe is 13.7 billion years old. It's enough to know that the best science extrapolating back from the apparent expansion of the universe we see today suggests that the universe is 13.7 billion years old. Best guess. Many free thinkers would agree that this is really what it is to say that they believe in most scientific facts. As we know, there are people who seriously claim that evolution, because it conflicts with the Bible, can't be true. But it is inarguable that a mountain of facts support the concept of biological evolution and no facts weigh against it in any meaningful way. When it comes to morals, well, we've already seen that the what and how of belief is a moral issue. For freethinkers, certainly it should be for everyone. But as far as the question of how we ought to behave towards others, freethinkers observe that there are only two options, two ways of deciding or making sense of it. One is the law of the jungle, or might makes right. That's what Christian morality is. God is the most mighty one, so what he says goes. The other principle is the golden rule, or the law of reciprocity. Facts and reason argue for the superiority of that, which we have discussed in the past more than once. It might sometimes appear that a reasonable person behaves according to the principle of might makes right, but that sometimes can be because the law of reciprocity demands that one respond in kind when others behave towards us on the basis of might makes right. You see how that works? Of course, there is another sort of morality that applies to attitudes and behaviors that affect only ourselves. That is yet another subject for another day, but we can easily appreciate that, for example, if a diet of Twinkies and cola causes people to go out and kill other people that we should not adopt that diet. An argument can also be made that other unhealthy habits and practices are at least morally questionable, but it is a different sort of morality than that which affects how we behave towards others. And this is a source of endless uh, confusion and consternation when uh, the God mongers confuse uh, morality that has to do with how we behave towards other people and morality that affects our only our personal lives. So to summarize, the way to be a free thinker is, first of all, to reject faith, to resolve to form beliefs without regard or without undue regard for tradition, authority, and established belief, to rely on facts and reason, as science does when making sense of the objective reality that we share with others. We can do that same kind of thing subjectively, but we have to realize that in making sense of the facts of our personal, private, and subjective experience, which is not science, that we are largely on our own. At the same time, it is certainly always helpful to seek and consider counsel from others for what others have found useful may be helpful to ourselves or not. In our personal lives and subjective experiences, just as in the larger enterprise of science, it is a process of trial and error. And we should not be afraid of failure or ashamed of being fallible. I uh, have a wonderful quote from Ed, uh, Thomas Edison I should have put up here. You know, he didn't say, uh, uh, I, I failed a thousand times to find a good uh, way to make a light bulb, just he, he, he discovered a thousand ways that it won't work. But we are the only ones who can rely on uh, to make the best judgment about those uh, things in our personal lives. And finally, we must cultivate curiosity while at the same time make an effort in all of that we do to make sense of things to doubt. For it is a certainty, it's a certainty that we're all wrong about something. We just don't yet know what it is or may be. Life is about finding that out. I want to conclude with some observations by a few notable freethinkers that echo these ideas. I'll let you just kind of chew on them and won't go into them in a great detail. Uh, it would be fun to do so. And I don't present them as heavy uh, as uh, holy scripture because freethinkers, as we have said, have no such texts. Everything is profound, not just one or two things. Or rather, freethinkers take it that there is something to learn in all that members of our species have had to say. If we could ever figure out what dolphins are saying, we maybe could learn something from them too. 
Each of these uh, quotations I'm going to put up are individual expressions of what they took to be the best way to think and live. So first one, science has taught me to be careful how I adopt a view which jumps with my preconceptions and to require stronger evidence for such belief than for one to which I was previously hostile. My business is to teach my aspirations to conform themselves to fact, not to try to make facts harmonize with my aspirations. Science seems to me to teach, sit down before fact as a little child, be prepared to give up every preconceived notion, follow humbly wherever and to whatever a business nature leads or you shall learn nothing. That's our friend Thomas Henry Huxley, Darwin's bulldog who said that. Free thought, broadly defined, is the right to believe as the evidence coming in contact with the mind forces it to believe. In other words, the opposite of faith, the opposite of the ability to choose your beliefs. Beliefs are involuntary, is uh, what uh, this person is saying. And she goes on, this implies the admission of any and all evidence bearing upon any subject which may come up for discussion. Among the subjects that come up for discussion, the moment so much is admitted is the existence of a god. The free thinker who recognizes the science of astronomy, the science of mathematics, and the equally positive and exact science of justice is logically forced to the denial of supreme authority. And that's Voltaire in Declare. Yeah, she was named after Voltaire, but uh, she was a 19th century woman, as you see there. Well, she lived into the 20th century. If you've never read her stuff, go and read it. What makes a free thinker is not his beliefs, but the way in which he holds them. If he holds them because his elders told him they were true when he was young, or if he holds them because if he did not, he would be unhappy, his thought is not free. But if he holds them because after careful thought he finds a balance of evidence in their favor, then his thought is free, however odd his conclusions may seem. That's Bertrand Russell, who lived, uh, born in the 19th century and uh, lived into quite a bit of the 20th. Famous guy, if you've never read his uh, Why I'm Not a Christian, Put that on your, get that and put it on your bookshelf and take it off your bookshelf and read it. And finally, I can live with doubt and uncertainty and not knowing. I think it's much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers which might be wrong. I have approximate answers and possible beliefs and different degrees of certainty about different things, but I'm not absolutely sure of anything. There are many things I don't know anything about, such as whether it means anything to ask, why are we here? I might think about it a little bit, and if I can't figure it out, then I go on to something else. But I don't have to know an answer. I don't feel frightened by not knowing things, by being lost in the mysterious universe without having any purpose, which is the way it really is, as far as I can tell. Possibly. It doesn't frighten me. That's Richard Feynman. If you haven't read any of his stuff, also well worth reading. His first autobiographical work was called uh, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. Nobel Prize winner, worked on the Manhattan Project uh, during World War II. Fascinating guy. So thank you very much for listening to all that. Give it some thought. Please think about it. And uh, here are our principles, our creed, if you will, reason to make sense of things and enjoy that, pursuing happiness. That's why curiosity is fun, because like Feynman said, it's it's fun to find stuff out. And it's even fun not knowing things and you know, having something to figure out. Appreciation to discover the good, having values. Of course, we have values. Uh, we've talked about that. The highest value, of course, is deciding uh, how you're going to believe in things and applying those principles. And finally, love to explore the meaning and purpose of life. Keep in mind, the free thought is not free. You can uh, visit, donate at our church website. There's a little button that you can go to PayPal and kick, a, kick some cash uh, our way. You know that's the root of all evil anyway. You don't need to have that stuff. Support your values by supporting the NTCOF. It's kind of like uh, all the donors to uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders could uh, kind of feel proud of themselves if they kicked them a little bit of money when they won the Nobel Prize. That kind of made them a little bit of a Nobel Prize winner themselves. Remember, we can do together what none of us can do on our own. We just can't do on our own what we can do collectively. Doesn't mean that collectivism is so good, but in some things it is. Some In some ways it's better. Join us in promoting facts and reason and in celebrating doubt. There's our holy trinity. There are facts, reason, doubt. We've already had a church presentation on facts, I believe. We need to have one on reason and another one on doubt. Um, go and look at the one on facts that's up on YouTube. 
Demonstrate your commitment by being the future that you wish to see is what Gandhi advised. And uh, he, he did pretty well for himself and uh, the people that he cared about. And finally, Melius Facet. Yep, we've got to have a Latin phrase. If we ever have our own college, we'll have to put that up there. That just simply means do better. That's all you can expect. Do better. And then with that, we'll move on to question and answer discussion. You might have some questions about what I put up. I'd love it if you would disagree with me and tell me where I'm wrong. Because I, it, it's hard to know where you're wrong until you figure it out where you're wrong. And uh, so thank you very much again.